What's that? Huh. Radio. What's going on with that radio? This is not a dream. What's happening to this place? Welcome to Now Playing Podcast's Silent Hill Retrospective Series. Part of Now Playing's video game movie review series. When you're hurt and scared for so long, your fear and pain turn to hate, and the hate starts to change the world. Hosted by Arnie. He was sent to take you back to Silent Hill. He was a member of the Order. Justin. Listen, huh? you may be able to hear the cries of his torment. And Stuart. Who are you to judge? We judge because the souls of history hang in the balance, because our faith has never failed us. This podcast may contain detailed plot spoilers and harsh language. Go to hell! Can't you see? We're already here. Listener discretion is advised. I will pray for you, Rose, but I won't expect you and your friend to return. Today we're discussing... Silent Hill Revelation 3D Starring Adelaide Clemens, Kit Harrington, Deborah Kale Unger, Martin Donovan, and Malcolm McDowell With Carrie Ann Moss and Sean Bean Directed by Michael J. Bassett This is your hunk of hunk of burning co-host, Arnie He's fucked up but goofy fun inside It's Stuart And this is Justin Six years! It took six years for a sequel to Silent Hill to happen. Was anyone clamoring for it, especially six years later? Well, it was one of those modest hits, right? Like, when you count all the international box office numbers, that's when it became a hit. Here in the States, I think it opened big and then quickly trailed off. It only made like 40 here, but internationally it made 100. And so you spent 50, 60 million on that. Do you make another one? I think it took Avatar. There was a rush of, we need to get some 3D movies out there. Let's see what we can do. They just went and found properties that could easily lend itself to such a thing. And they slashed the budget in half. Why are we spending 50 million when we can spend 20 million? So we get a sequel whose ambition has been curtailed. Half the budget, twice the cameras. (laughs) Because you mentioned they were doing things in 3D back then, but let's give credit where credit's due. This was a heyday of 3D when things were actually still being filmed in 3D because people still wanted that Avatar money. Whatever I say about this movie, it is gorgeously 3D. I broke out the glasses, I popped the cherry on my 4K 3D television, even though it was just a Blu-ray, but it upconverted to 4K res. The 3D is incredible i had to pay through the nose to get the 3d blu-ray worth it if i had to watch this movie 3d was the way to go oh wow i was thankful it took me about halfway through the movie to realize oh this is a 3d money grab i'm glad that time is over where we were clamoring as a society for 3d gimmickry on the screen because as i've said before that just gives me a headache And it never really pulls me further into the movie when I'm sitting in a theater with those glasses on. You know what? If it were available to me, Arnie, I would have watched it that way. But I didn't go to movie theaters to see this. I just watched it the regular 2D streaming at home. The best thing about this movie we're going to discuss was its 3D stereoscopic depth and effects and the way the snow and the ash floated in front of me. My God, it really was good 3D. I mean, the trailer was good 3D. I watched the trailer of it. The menus felt like they had depth. Man, an amazing 3D film, truly a reference disc. If you're only going to watch five minutes to say, look how cool the 3D is. <laughs> Not to show your hand too much. Yeah, you wouldn't want to watch too much of the movie. You might get caught up in that plot. And that certainly was something we all got caught up in last time. There was room for improvement. I was hoping the revelation was that under new creative hands, we would have a 
Isn't that a better story? At least a streamlined story that went in a different direction. But we have Michael J. Bassett, who's... The only credits I recognize is he makes a lot of TV shows for Stars Network, like Power and Ash vs. the Evil Dead, totally jumping on the storylines that were left dangling last time and muddying the waters even further. I'm even more confused now that they've revealed something to me. (laughs) And I was just shocked. I mean, coming into a sequel, especially while we're in the arcade, to see so many returning actors and adding Malcolm McDowell? Wow, okay, so there's something legit happening here. Yeah, but that isn't Malcolm McDowell. I mean, I just remember when we discussed him in Firestarter Rekindled. I mean, this man is a whore, darling. Yes, he has his high moments. I would look at Rob Zombie's Halloween as a high moment. Burr? Or Clockwork Orange. Just saying. No, I'm saying in his <laughs> latter day. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, On the downslide. My go to, you know, yeah. would be like, man, the early years is obviously where you're going to see him on fire as an actor. Yeah, I'm talking about after his Wing Commander days. Yes. A Clockwork Orange is immediately what I think of when I think of this man. And the second thing I think of is whore. Because, I mean, yeah, there was Caligula. But really, there is this period where from that Silent Night remake, remember him in that? Maybe. He was the sheriff. You're looking confused. (laughs) He turns up a lot in junk. Yes, people remember him from Clockwork and throw him in any trash movie they can find, hoping he'll bring some of that. Yeah, he has a name and people go, oh yeah, him. But... The last thing I really remember him being in that had a level of respect to it might be Star Trek Generations. And even then I was like, wow, they pulled him out of something. But Mr. Magoo, Firestarter, Vamps. I mean, this guy picks shit. Or does he pick or does he just say yes to everything? I mean, his IMDb page is just page after page of credits. You know, you call them credits. I call them embarrassments. (laughs) Paychecks. What have you. I remember, again, when I met Lance Henriksen and had him sign Mangler 2, and he said, yeah, this was an alimony check. How many wives has Malcolm McDowell had to justify all these (laughs) damn movies? So, yeah, you say he's bringing something. This was my exact thought is, oh, Malcolm Mc... Oh, yeah, it's Malcolm McDowell. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we see a few respectable or formerly respectable people in this cast list. It's also worth pointing out the source material is very respected. This is another example of them going straight to the game. Silent Hill 3 is the story of a teenage daughter named Heather who has a nightmare in a carnival, is approached by a private detective who tells her she's actually the child from the first film and that her dad has been killed by someone named Claudia and she's got to go to Silent Hill and face a cult. I was really hoping that this movie would base itself off Silent Hill 2. Again, that is my favorite of the ones I played. I did play a little bit of Silent Hill 3. I got enough into it to see the private detective and realize, okay, so they're using a lot of the iconography from Silent Hill 3. And it makes sense if you want to continue the movies since Silent Hill 3 did pick up the Silent Hill 1 story. All right, let's go there. Let's have teenage Sharon trying to rescue her father, whereas we had the mother previously trying to rescue the daughter. And now as our Sharon, we have who I believe they took Michelle Williams into a cloning lab with Dolly (laughs) the Sheep and came out with Adelaide Clemens. Thank you. I'm not the only one who thinks that then. Yes, very much a mini Michelle Williams. (laughs) I looked at her IMDb and I believe the only thing I've seen her in other than this was X-Men's Origins Wolverine, where she had the role of Carnival Girl. Oh, sure. I'm sure you picked her out of the crowd there. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) I'm shocked Sean Bean survived the last movie and came back for this movie. I assumed it's just to die. Like, excuse me, you forgot to kill me last time. Exactly. (laughs) 
<laughs> Can we fix that? And we get a little bit of Game of Thrones going on here because Kit Harrington is Jon Snow. So I think this is pre-fame Kit Harrington. This is when he was just kind of taking jobs before he'd blow up because of Game of Thrones. I think it's pre-acting class Kit Harrington because Ugh. if you had told me it was Jon Snow, I wouldn't have believed you because I like Jon Snow and this guy sucks. It's definitely pre-dialect coach. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> All right, well, let's get into it, guys. You're already showing your hand here. I, you could jump straight to recommends. I think you've already said them, but Arnie, given the plot first, we'll walk back to Silent Hill 2. All right. Do you guys remember the end of Silent Hill 1? I mean, it was just seven days ago. Mm. We had Christopher DeSalva, played by Sean Bean. His daughter, Sharon, had nightmares. Wife Rose, played by Rada Mitchell, abducted the girl and took her to Silent Hill. And Rose discovered Sharon was some magical spirit offshoot spinoff of a burned witch. The good parts of this burned witch became a baby. Yeah, and the bad parts were all in that last half hour. (laughs) <laughs> well, at the end of that movie, we saw Sharon and Rose try to return to Christopher, but they're trapped in the mirror dimension. Well, we find out at the start of Revelation, Rose found a way for one of them to return to the living using the seal of Megatron. Using the seal <laughs> of Metatron. Yeah, I know. I was like, the Allspark? What, right? the Transformers crossover? <laughs> what? <laughs> Same difference. It might as well be. It's a talisman and Rose has half of it. And as Rada Mitchell does not want to do this movie again, she sends Sharon through instead of herself. So she just has a cameo. And Sharon is now a teenager played by Adelaide Clemens. But the cult from Silent Hill, called The Order, still wants Sharon. Christopher killed one of their disciples. So now Sharon and Christopher live a nomadic life, moving from town to town, changing their names each time. When Revelation starts, Sharon is now known as Heather Mason. So Heather, Sharon, doesn't really remember much of what happened in Silent Hill. It's been a week and neither do I. I don't think I understood it at the time. So she's completely unaware that she's a half-witch spin-off lightness or something. (laughs) I mean, what would you say? Yes, it's a hard one to (laughs) fill out the form for. (laughs) Male, female, half-witch lightness of being. (laughs) (laughs) Essence of a witch. (laughs) So, Heather is really confused when a private detective played by Martin Donovan comes and says he was hired to find her and take her back to Silent Hill, but when he found out the cult wanted to kill Heather, he decided to warn her instead. So, the cultists kill the detective and abduct Christopher and take him to Silent Hill. And Heather meets fellow high school student Vincent, played by Kit Harrington. He is with her when Heather gets the message to go to Silent Hill to save her father. And Vincent goes with her because it turns out he's the son of the head cultist, Claudia Wolf, played by Carrie Ann Moss. Yeah, who's different than the head cultist that we had in the last film. I think she was vice head cultist last time. (laughs) She's been promoted. It's mentioned she's Christabella's sister. I don't know why she didn't burn up with the rest of them, but I guess they were off in a different wing of the building. She called in sick that day. Mm -hmm. They they were at a witch conference out of town. (laughs) But Vincent, like the private detective, tries to warn Heather... And he's taken away. But he tells Heather to find his grandfather, Leonard, played by Malcolm McDowell. (laughs) In an insane asylum where they all should be. In an Afghan, he took off a couch. Yeah. (laughs) Leonard has the other half of the seal of Metatron. And if Heather can get both halves together, she can defeat the cult. (laughs) So... Okay, she finds Leonard in the insane asylum. She doesn't even have to work that hard to do it. He shoves her half of the seal into his chest, which turns him into a CGI thing that Heather has to fight. And then she gets the seal back, both halves conjoined. And with it, she saves Vincent, and they find Dark Alessa, who merges with Heather again to make one whole girl again? Didn't we already do this? I don't know. Maybe when the seal of Metatron split in half, so did Alessa. Well, it turns out the real plot of the cult was not to burn Alessa for being a witch, but to actually use Alessa to give birth to an evil god that would punish sinners. 
Mm -hmm. I don't know why you want to immolate your vessel for God, but... (laughs) Well, that was Christabella. This is Claudia. Well, now that the two girls are one again, they can bring forth that God. But Alessa uses her seal to call Pyramid Head to kill the cultist's personal enforcer called the Missionary. This allows Heather to get Vincent and her dad, Christopher, and escape. But Christopher decides, hey, I'm Sean Bean and I haven't died yet, so I'm going to stay in town until I find Rose. So Heather and Vincent hitchhike out of town as credits roll. (laughs) I'll give the movie something else. I complimented its 3D. I think it has a decent visual style in 3D. It also has a much more simple plot. It is very much A to B to C to D. Is it logical? Fuck no. But is it easy to understand? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> well, also gone is the nice cinematography that we enjoyed in the first one. I mean, last time we had a very nice cut between lush green forests and the white ashy world of Silent Hill. Now, when we're in the real world, we're in like the outskirts of Pittsburgh in the middle of December when everything's gray anyway. So when we do get to Silent Hill, they kind of juxtapose it a little bit. We're going to see a carnival with full power and lights and stuff like that. So it's automatically losing that feel and atmosphere that the first one set up. Oh, absolutely. The second I see Pyramid Head get on a tricycle to make the carousel go around, I'm like, okay, they really don't have any money to power a carousel. (laughs) And they're having the actors do it with exercise bikes. This is pathetic. No phones, no bikes, no motor cars, not a single luxury. (laughs) But I'll agree with you, it's a little bit chintzy. But, again, I did not watch this in 2D. I watched it only in 3D. And what it lacks in cinematography skill, it makes up for visually with that 3D. I need to, and I'm not going to do it much, I promise, but I find myself needing... To come to the defense of Michael J. Bassett. Mm. Because he has come out and been like, yeah, I tried to do what I could with this movie, but I was friends with the producer. I tried to make a lot of compromises, one of which was half the budget and filming in 3D, which was a huge pain in the ass. I said, let's move the camera here. Can't move the camera. All right, well, let's do this tracking shot. Can't do a tracking shot. Let's light it this way. Can't light it that way. Everything must be in focus. He was hamstrung from the beginning. The 3D is great, but yes, he was working under severe limitations technologically. Sure, but location scouting is a completely different thing, and they could have picked someplace better for the real world than what we got. The problem is, the only thing the last movie had going for it was the mood it was able to create instantly, and for much of its runtime, for my money. Here, in this first scene where it's a dream within a dream about a carnival where you can win a dead fish or a bloody bunny doll. And I have a problem. Dead fish float. They don't sink. Yes. This was my very first continuity (laughs) problem, is why does the fish sink? They couldn't afford real dead fish. (laughs) (laughs) Wasn't Faith No More touring Canada at that time? I'm sure they had some dead fish to go around. (laughs) But yeah, once we get back into it, it just seems like we didn't need to go back to Sharon and to Christopher, right? That was a closed story loop that was kind of ugly and tangled, and I really resent that we're going to pick up and that they're going to try to fix it. I don't want them to fix it. Well, it answers a question that I'm not sure the last movie asked, really. like It was left on a cliffhanger, yes. We thought they were back in the house, but Sean Bean didn't see them. Well, we come to find out that the wife had brought the girl back, but she had to stay behind for some reason. Yeah, because she only had half the money. Like, there's a coin, but there's only half the coin, which is like a metaphor for this whole movie. (laughs) But yeah, okay, whatever. Your magic talisman means that we can return the girl. What do you think she knows? What she's been told, she has total amnesia about all of this, was she was in a car accident, but for the last, what, seven years... Every year or so, her dad runs to her and says, you're now Brenda, we got to get out of here and dye your hair. Why would she think that that all came from a car accident? Well, she saw him commit a murder. Yeah. Right. Yeah, a cultist comes at him with a knife at one point while she's still in pigtails, and she thinks that they're on the run, which they are, they're on the run for having murdered an intruder, but what he's not telling her was that intruder was from Silent Hill? Yeah, they've been sending out 
scouts. The ones that were grabbed by the barbed wire burn victim and ripped into pieces are still there? Or a, a new group? Yeah, this is a totally new cult, I think, the Order of Talil. It's run by the former cult leader's sister, and they don't want to burn witches, they want to bring gods. So I think what we've got is this is the Pepsi to Alice Krieg's Coke. Okay, well, yeah, you're getting to my next confusion, which is that I thought last movie, the reason why Sharon had dreams about Silent Hill was because her darker half was calling her home so that they could take on the cultists. Now she's having these dreams because the cultists want her to come because unifying with her evil sister will mean that they can kill a god and also impregnate her to create a new god that will kill. Hmm. Yeah, what, where's your confusion here? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. You're right. I'm just, I'm a little slow. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me drink some coffee, catch up with you guys. Brilliant. What I meant to say is it's brilliant that we now have Heather and Harry, which are the names of the characters from the video game. That's, I guess, an end joke is that they now go by aliases that are actually the characters from the game. And it's flipped the gender so that it's like what it was in Silent Hill when it was a dad and his daughter. We didn't have that Rose thing. But we do have Rada Mitchell coming back inexplicably for two minutes to do something in a mirror. What I read is Rada Mitchell. Does she work much? Do people know Rada Mitchell? Do you guys know Rada Mitchell? I know her from indie films. I've seen her in small stuff. She's Australian. I saw her do a, a lesbian art movie with Ali Sheedy that was actually pretty good. Apparently, she's a pain in the ass. Mm. She really fought with the director last time because her method is, okay, we're going to film the scene four or five times while I get into character, and then I'm ready. And that's wasting a hell of a lot of time. So mm -hmm. I think possibly the reason they flipped it up is we can't afford the time with Rada. So let's do her one scene four or five times so she can get in character. It's a one minute scene. So we'll have her offset in 15 minutes. For the limited budget, the limited everything on screen here, it, it really is shocking to me that they're bringing so many of these original people back, especially for such small little, I mean, I don't even want to call it a cameo. She was there for, literally for a 10 second shot and maybe half a day of shooting. And not only that, but she's like, Christopher, my love, take care of our daughter. I'm like, weren't you the chick that abducted her and ran away from him? I didn't get the sense that they were in love, but now that she's in limbo, she just can't stop fawning on him. This relationship doesn't feel like the one that I remember. Yeah, I still don't know why they were fighting so badly in the last movie. I mean, they were married. They were adopting a child together. They're contentious relationship was the one I never understood. I'm okay with the oh my love because now that she doesn't have credit cards he can turn off. I don't see what they're fighting about. <laughs> and it, it brings a question. Has he been communicating with her over these years or is that a one-time thing in the mirror? Yeah, I think that she's popping back as a way of warning him that he needs to protect their daughter because she's been found. Because she still lives in a, a version of Silent Hill She's aware that the cultists have a link into getting this girl and dragging her back there. You would think that Christopher, if he did indeed love his wife, would be back at Silent Hill, would, would never have left, would have kept looking for her. But instead, they've been on the run up and down various nameless cities, changing their identity because they don't want to be found by these ghosts what do we want to call them they can only come into our world when they cut tattoos into their chest and that gives them like a couple days to go out with a dagger and try and get them the symbol is straight out of the game and in the game that symbol is used to kind of try to fight back the evil spirits here i don't know yeah let's <laughs> not let's not not dwell on something that they didn't spend time developing. I, uh, For poor reasons, they feel a threat from the witch hunters of Silent Hill and not from Alessa, who is also still in Silent Hill. From a storytelling standpoint, I guess it might make sense to have our main character, Heather, be in the dark on this situation so we can learn along with her. But in a reality sense... You know, after a couple times, I can see Harry's wanting to protect his daughter. But after a couple years, you're probably going to fill her in on what's going on. 
Yeah. Well, he is set her up at a new school, the All Hollows High School. Like, that's a real place. <laughs> and uh, given her a new vest, which I presume she wears in the video game. Otherwise, why are we spending so much time on a jean jacket? And sending her off to be humiliated by people that think she looks like she dresses at Goodwill and are really mean to her. And she makes friends with the other new kid, Kit Harrington's Vincent. I did not recognize him as Jon Snow. The actor's name sounded familiar to me, but immediately I'm like, all right, there's something wrong with this kid. First of all, it's the middle of the school year and there's two new students. The only time I like him in the entire movie is when Heather is asked to introduce herself to the class and she stands up and gives this wonderful speech that basically summarizes down to fuck all y'all. Then he has to introduce himself and he's like, I'm supposed to follow that? That is the only time he feels natural the entire movie. Because I agree. I mean, how that's a great way to endear yourself to the students who have all just witnessed some freaky blonde chick just go off on a tirade. Even if you didn't know Silent Hill 3 had a character named Vincent that was back at Silent Hill luring the character of Heather there, I think you would know, I knew instantly that this guy is here only as a way of luring her back to the place that, you know, her father says she absolutely can never go to Silent Hill. She wakes up, she has these dreams, she writes those words down, she doesn't even know where it is or what it represents. The father will grab it and throw it in a carved box where he he keeps all of the scraps of information about the town. She has no idea about the dangers that lie there until he is abducted and she has to go find him. He really is anti-town. First movie, second movie, just not going to that. I don't care. Not going. It might fix it. Fuck it. Not going to that town. <laughs> he is completely in denial. Yeah. And why? Again, I asked, like, if you know that your wife is still there and she just needs the other half a coin, that seems like a plot worth working on if you indeed consider her your love. Again, maybe they didn't. Uh, maybe it's easier to live separate lives. <laughs> so, yeah, these two meet each other on their first day of school, which is in the middle of the school year, and he seems to be following her around. Heather calls her father saying, I think I'm being followed. They make a plan to meet at the mall so they're not going to give up where they live. And something happens to Harry between the time she gets to the mall and things start falling apart. Yeah. She agrees to meet him at Happy Burger, which ends up being like populated with bloody clowns and they're slicing meat off people and throwing it on the grill. It still looks better than Arby's to me. I'm just going to say... <laughs> You try to gross me out, but I'm like, eh, that looks like a traditional food court in the mall. You and Marjorie, <laughs> you anti-Arby's folk. <laughs> it's a hard line, man. There's people who, on both sides of that war. Curly fries? Shit. <laughs> but yeah, and this is after the private detectives already come and been killed, right? I mean, I mean, it's kind of happening at the same time. She's been followed by a man in a trench coat. Again, if you know the game, you know who this Douglas character is. But he will come to her. He screams Sharon while she's watching clowns eat bloody meat on a burger. And she'll realize that he knows a lot more about her than she knows about him. He'll explain this whole thing about where she comes from, that her father has been lying to her. And then, yeah, a Cenobite comes, chops off his hands, and we even get Pyramid Head. But can we take a second to dwell here? Because in the first movie... At least there was a clear delineation between Silent Hill and the real world. Mm -hmm. And in this one, she's having dreams at the beginning. She's in the real world. She's at the mall. And then all of a sudden, things in the mall turn into this nightmarish, not necessarily Silent Hill, but this nightmarish scenario right in front of her. What are we supposed to be taking away from this? What is happening here? Oh, yeah. It's even better than that. Once Vincent, again, he's following her at this mall, even after dead bodies have dropped. He's like, hey, do you want to walk home? Like, he's trying to get a date. And to make conversation on the bus, she's like, do you think there's a difference between dreams and reality? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> All right, he has to be evil because he doesn't even blink at that. He's like, oh, yeah, my grandfather can't tell the difference between humans and monsters. It's totally normal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you use Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, their courtship is unintentionally hysterical. <laughs> the fact that he ends up being an agent for Silent Hill is only trumped by the fact that if he hadn't been, 
that is the craziest kid in movie history. He met this girl this <laughs> afternoon and finds himself on the road with her, having a very serious I kind of love you conversation at a roadside motel seven hours later. Yeah, he's not even paying attention. He walks her home. She walks in the front door. The whole living room is covered in blood, presumably of her father's, and scrawled on the wall, go to Silent Hill. After everyone's been saying, whatever you do, don't go to Silent Hill. And he's like, hey, I got a car. Let's go. Like, sure, why not? I'll just drive for hours. Hours. Nicest blood penmanship I've ever seen, by the way. Those letters were crisp and clean and all of the same size. Very well done by whoever wrote the blood message. Who did write the blood message? Who came from Silent Hill to get the dad if this was for Vincent to get the girl? Like, how many agents do they have and how many times can they use their booga booga magic? I think it's the missionary. They sent the missionary and they sent Vincent. Good cop, bad cop. Vincent's supposed to lure her with love. The missionary is supposed to just grab her and drag her by her hair. And the missionary, it's not, no one ever uses that term, but just so you know, it's the Cenobite with the CDs in him from Hellraiser 3 has popped into this movie. Yes. <laughs> like I told you last time, any Silent Hill art design could be anywhere else. Oh, don't compare this movie with last week. No way is this the same thing. This is looking really shabby. But they're pulling their creatures from the same well, which is the video games. Right. And now we're hearing a lot about this Order of Vatil or whatever the hell they're saying. I, don't, I think that's French for stupid, but <laughs> this is where we're starting to get the details that what's luring her back are the witch hunters, the ones that wanted to burn her, and not Alessa, who's also there. But again, uh, what do they want? You say this is simpler. What's the simple answer here? They want to give birth to a god that will kill sinners. Okay. And Alessa has nothing to do with that. It's all about Heather, her good half. They need them together to do it. Okay. All right. Because, yes, it's mentioned that for a hundred years, they were waiting for a child capable of having such a god baby. And that was Alessa. But since Alessa cleverly broke off her better self into a creature now calling herself Heather, they need that Heather part. I guess that makes sense if anything I just said makes any sense at all, which it doesn't, by the way. <laughs> it makes Silent Hill movie sense. I mean, understand Silent Hill, the games, one of their positives is that they do have a dreamlike quality where you can debate and reflect on what was real. The game developers intentionally put contradictory information in the games so that you can't just walk away and go, well, that was that. So that you can actually have these kinds of conversations like we're having about what the hell's going on, what did we really see? Right, that's all fine and well, but don't tell me that this is cleverly constructed confusion. This is just a new guy's take on someone else's unarticulated ideas taken from a, an ambiguous game. So there's several layers of nonsense here that is filtered <laughs> down into where we're at. It's about where I am with it, too. Right. So let's get to Silent Hill. They get there. It's later than they did in the original movie, but this is a shorter movie by 30 minutes or more. So really, we get a rush job. Once we're there and, and the ash is falling down, pop, 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 pop. It's easy steps for Heather as she finds her way. Ultimately, she's going to go back to that carnival. But she's got to first get this talisman that I guess her father had it. The wife gave it to the father in the mirror and he put it in the box. And because she now has the box, she has it when they get to the <laughs> motel. <laughs> but it's, she still needs to get the other half, which... Vincent told her is with his crazy grandfather before he's sucked away by his evil mother who came out of the walls of a motel. I hate saying this. <laughs> like, I hate that people are having to think about what I'm saying and imagine it. It's so cruelly stupid. <laughs> But that's what's happening. She has a magic Megatron device, but only half of it. And she needs to find another equally insane person inside Silent Hill to smash those two together so that she'll have the power of Megaton. What is it? Metatron. Metatron. It is. Okay. It's really close to Megatron. It is, but Metatron is an archangel from Judaism. Hmm. Of course. I think we encountered him in Constantine. Sure. 
He's Old Testament stuff, not Cybertronian stuff. Right. He's old school. I need to read the Bible more and I'll understand what's going on here. Bible that, more, yeah. Transformers less. I'm not even a Christian and I advocate that. Mm. <laughs> So anyway, she gets to the ashy place. She's been separated from Vincent in the same way that Ryder Mitchell was separated from the cops. Because it's scarier for a woman to be alone in this environment than it is for two people to be walking there. And of course, Vincent knows where everything is and will eventually show her where she's going. For the meantime, we get this kind of random scene where apparently two women broke down outside Silent Hill and are now being turned into mannequins by a... Mannequin spider? This has something to do with Christabella, I think. Because did you notice Christabella's lair last movie had all kinds of mannequins around it and things? I wondered if there was something that was happening there. You actually assume that Christabella was taking runaways and turning them into mannequins? All I'm saying is there were mannequins in the last movie. <laughs> okay, well, yeah. <laughs> this is a new flourish that we have a spider made out of mannequin parts, and it likes to just watch naked women turn into plastic. This part was a little creepy, you know, having her stumble around this warehouse with shelves filled with mannequin parts wrapped in plastic wrap and to have one of them turn to her with real life eyes and blink. There's a little bit of creepiness going on here. And the spider part does come off kind of hokey. But at the same time, I feel like it's within that style of the game and is working to a certain degree that a lot of this movie hasn't so far. I like the design of the spider mannequin creature, but I actually think when I was watching some bonus features, it looked better in 2D. In 3D, it was really a blur and I could not keep up with it. In 2D, I thought it looked pretty sharp. I guess I would be more okay with it if I felt like any of this had to do with anything. But, I mean, this is not connected with any of the other crazy plots that are running through this. This is just a spider that likes to make hitchhikers into mannequins. And as soon as we run away from it, we'll never think about it again. Is that the case? I thought it was still part of the Order's... I mean, I'm open, really. I did not get any sense that anyone from the Order even knew it was there in the warehouse doing this. <laughs> it's just doing its own thing. <laughs> and why would they? What would you build a mannequin spider to do while you waited for the child that was going to birth the kill god? I Make mannequins. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously. Yeah, I, you're right. There is a lot of osh gosh be gosh that we need to put on these mannequins <laughs> to put in the Main Street convenience store, <laughs> department stores. They got to come from somewhere. <laughs> There's one thing that Silent Hill has. It's good quality real estate for businesses. A lot of windows. Made in America. <laughs> Anyway, eventually she finds her way to that asylum where we know that the grandfather is and where I assume we were going to meet Malcolm McDowell because his name's in the credit. And if there's a grandfather character, he would seem right for it. I was not expecting much from Malcolm McDowell in this movie for reasons I've already stated, but I think I expected more than three minutes of screen time. I was disappointed even that he wasn't hamming it up poorly for long. Yeah, I was disappointed in his outfit. I was disappointed that he was treated in this way and that I had to think about him having to perform this again and again for the cameras. <laughs> it's just sad. Yeah, Arnie, you said that you realized by seeing his name about halfway through seeing his name what a whore Malcolm McDowell has become in movies. It took me to getting to this scene to come to that realization. So yeah, this was a letdown. It's like, Malcolm McDowell! Oh, crap. Yeah, Malcolm McDowell in a moo moo playing Hannibal Lecter while he's bitching about his family. I mean, it's the opposite of cool. And this guy usually is cool. Even in bad movies, I think he's cool. But this is highly uncool. Little of the old ultra shitty performance. Yeah, and then they quickly save him with CGI because her half of the Metatron medallion turns him into a beastie that he can break his chains. You know, he's kept in this room where he's chained up. He can break through that, tear through the doors, sling Heather over his shoulder to do... If she didn't rip it out of his chest, what would have happened next? I thought he would have killed her. I thought he was just like a demon monster murderer out of yeah. his mind. Yeah, but he was conveniently carrying her somewhere to put her in a cell or something while she was being held eye level 
at the gaping hole in his body so she could grab the now complete medallion. Here's the difference is that I do think that in the original film, while you didn't know what was going on, you understood physics. You understood basic, like, okay, we're in the room and we know that we're looking for Sharon. We know basically what's up here. I do not know what I should be hoping for. What is the goal here? I guess we're just to find Sean Bean. That's the thing that we're supposed to care about. I don't care enough about his character. just want to see him rescued. Yeah, it really does just feel like a video game that you're not engaged with and you're just trying to survive the levels. It feels like one that got like recalled, like they didn't finish, like it got scrapped. We were working on it and then they canceled it. But you can still play it if you want. It's got a lot of bugs. I've bought some of those games. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and eventually she's going to find Vincent here because he was thrown in the insane asylum because his mother was mad that he's fallen in love with Heather. And that he was actually trying to help her and not lead her into the plot. And so he's insane now and they throw him in a room and we have, I don't know, a vaguely cool scene in which we at least get Pyramid Head back to chop off hands reaching through bars. And the crazy faceless nurses are here as well. He's being rescued from a gurney while they try to slice him. Again, those nurses are a great design. I really like them quite a lot. I don't understand who's attacking who for why. And I think he was turned to the light side a little too easily. To say the least here. But what it really does, it feels like every time they want to have a revelation, it's just a recreation. It's, oh, let's do what we did in the last movie that creeped you out so well. Except, oh yeah, we don't have the same budget, we don't have the same quality of actors, and we haven't created any sense of mood. So it's just a sad remake of a movie that didn't work that well to begin with. And I never even got the sense that Vincent was really working for his mother anyway. Like, when mm -hmm. he was talking about his grandfather, I thought he trusted his grandfather was actually a true human being, and not actually twisted, and had a plot of his own. This whole thing is a mess. It also raises my question that I asked last week, is Pyramid Head a guy, or is there a bunch of them? Because he's back. Obviously, he died in the last one. In the games, there's a bunch of them. Mm. Okay. Okay, he's in this insane asylum, kicking ass, slicing off the hands. It looks good in 3D, no doubt. But then, yeah, he's going to turn right back around and go to a carnival and have to make the goddamn merry-go-round go around <laughs> again by doing the bicycle. Yeah, last time he was at least a glorified henchman. Now he's just got, like, odd jobs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Clean up in aisle three. <laughs> it is really disappointing. And the worst part is, I don't care. I don't care about any of this. None of the performances are drawing me in. None of the storyline is intriguing me. I thought the last one was convoluted, but I'm missing the nebulous nature of that story when faced with utter ignorance. Yeah, what's clear to me, the only way to save this would have been not to pick up any of those story strands at all. You just have Pyramid Head and some new people that get caught up in the town's lore for some reason. And you can have new characters that don't have anything to do with Alessa and Sharon and all of that stupidity. The fact that they've dragged us back into that has only meant that we have had to re-examine how stupid it was to begin with. And in trying to reveal something new, they have only exposed their own and competence in writing and recreating the best moments of the film. Yeah, I mean, they could have taken the events of the last movie and made this movie about the lore of those events and people wondering, you know, for all these years, they've heard stories about this and we could pick up a story of people actually going there, finding their way into there and finding out it's all true. That's a backdrop of something that doesn't have to pick up all these strands that I felt like weren't even loose leaving the first movie. Yeah. And again, they made this work as Silent Hill 3, and it was very effective. So what is not working here is the abridgment and the fact that they modified the story so much the first time. And the director, again, he came out before this film came out, and he was like, I'm not going to retcon the first movie. I'm going to stay true to the first movie while also 
honoring Silent Hill 3. But then he's created all these retcons that like Alyssa and Heather never merged before or anything. And so what you're left with is this weird amalgam. I mean, it's kind of like the good Heather was shot off into the Silent Hill 3 video game. And we're left here with Dark Alessa of this crappy film. Yeah, it all comes to a head when after they finish up at the park, they walk into the sanctuary and there's, God damn it, it's Carrie Ann Moss. Ten years after the Matrix sequels, did she deserve this? Yes, but I didn't recognize her. <laughs> <laughs> she deserved this? Yes. This is very unkind. <laughs> Have you seen the other shit she's done? Memento. I mean, there were some good times. Memento, Matrix, part one. Yeah, I just don't feel like Malcolm McDowell, like almost everyone in this cast. I'm like, oh, wow. Your agent couldn't find anything else, huh? Listen, the same year the first Silent Hill movie came out, Carrie Ann Moss was in this piece of shit Billy Connolly zombie movie called Fido. From that moment on, she has less respect from me than Malcolm McDowell. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I mean, it's hard to argue when she's wearing this fright wig and you can defeat her by handing her the Megatron <laughs> <laughs> token. Metatron, like, like Met... To metronome. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Sure. Whatever you want to call it. She hands her a coin and she burns <laughs> up and turns into what they're calling the mercenary. But again, it's just some kind of s and saw blades in her face creature. The missionary, not the mercenary. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it was a mercenary. Yeah. The mercenary. His name's Malcolm McDowell. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> But I like where they're heading on this. I mean, we do really? want... Well, yeah, I do want to see Pyramid Head <laughs> use his sword on somebody. <laughs> okay. That is the climax I wanted to see. The fact that they're able to utilize him, that he becomes a force of good, or at least helping them to escape, that seems like the right instinct. It's about the only right instinct that I can find in the last hour of the film. But, yikes. Now we're getting dangerously close to a fighting game movie. We're, we're in an arena... With a bunch of set dressing, we have a big guy with a big sword. It's starting to feel a little Mortal kombat -y here. Which would be an improvement. Sure. That second Mortal Kombat's an improvement. Ooh, all right. I think you're being a little bit mean there with Mutaro. <laughs> Give me Mannequin Spider over Mutaro. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't help but think that fans of the game series are feeling served here. Even though I haven't played the games, this doesn't feel of the same genre that I've been told the game is. You know what the difference is? The director the first time was a real fan of the games. He was passionate about the games. He wanted to make a movie about the games. And while I don't feel he successfully adapted the game into a enjoyable cinematic experience, at least he respected the material. This guy wanted a job. This guy wanted to come in and make a second movie and serve all the masters and meet the tech requirements, but he doesn't care. I don't even know how much he's played the games. And even he's come out and been like, you know what? That movie is shit. That movie is terrible. I fucked it up. And so I'm not going to disagree with him. I think that he doesn't know Silent Hill enough to do it right. I think he's looking at the first movie and going, you know what would be really cool is if we had Pyramid Head getting into a lot more fights. Again, that one I'm, I'm okay with, but I do agree. He probably didn't have a lot of control over this. It was probably all the producer making the film he wanted to make last time with a director that he could bend to his will and just not a lot of strong creative vision in, in general. They just repeated the imagery of of the last film the nurses and the sword and all of it is just shit we had seen before done at a much higher production budget and so it's very disappointing as someone that tried to see the positives of what they had going i could see nothing but down now that they're stumbling out of silent hill and it's a happy ending because sean bean is going to go find his wife and he's going to let his daughter run off with kid harrington it's a happy ending in that it's over i mean I don't really know that Sean Bean, on an endless mission to find his wife in an alternate dimension, I wouldn't call it happy. Happy is he finds her and escapes with her. It might be notable that Sean Bean not only survived a movie, he survived a series of movies. 
Or he might be dead and that's why he can't leave. I mean, you can make that case too. But again, this might seem like a tease for a part three. Obviously, they thought that they could keep this going. That's why we also have this truck driver pull up. Travis Grady is a character in Silent Hill 5. That was a prequel game where a truck driver came into town to rescue a child and found out more about the cult and how it started there. So they thought that they were going to just be able to continue on through all of the Silent Hill video games and crank them out in the same way that Resident Evil did. And this movie is bad enough to stop those ambitious cold. Is he a creepy pedophile in the game or is that just something they did in the movie to end it? That guy was off the charts weird. Maybe he was just overplaying the small role they gave him, but boy, oh boy. <laughs> yeah, again, remember, it wasn't going to be a small role if they came back with part three, but the thing, though, that I can't feel confident about is what you said, Stuart. It took six years between part one and part two. This is the sixth year between part two and today. Uh, do we know for sure part three isn't coming like in 2020? <laughs> yeah, I know this thing didn't make the money the first movie did. So if it's coming out, it'll be a YouTube short that we don't have to review at least. Silent Hill, the HBO series. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, coming next year, everything on HBO. Where is the video game series now? I mean, a lot of these that we talk about have either been revived or have remained fan favorites through the years no matter what. Silent Hill feels like very much a product of the 2000s. Yeah, it seemed to hit its stride when it had that original creative team Arnie described, where the misfits at Konami were just allowed to just do what they wanted to do, and they cranked out the first four Silent Hills. That's where the love seems to be. Things that happened afterwards were always seen as disappointing. It did become more of an action series. They had some cool moves. One game I'd like to play is Silent Hill Shattered Memories, where apparently the game actually psychologically profiles you and will change play based on who they think you are. Mm -hmm. It's a cool concept. I hear it didn't totally work, but that's a cool idea. Fans were very excited it was going to get the comeback that would make it relevant again in 2014. Because Guillermo del Toro yep. and the designer of Metal Gear series, I don't know that series, but it's beloved Konami property, and actor Norman Reedus of Walking Dead were all signed on. They released this playable teaser that if you were able to get out of a room and figure out who murdered his family, you would be standing on the streets of Silent Hills. And everyone thought that would be the game to make it not a retro, oh, remember that thing from 15 years. It would have put it back at the forefront of great games of right now. And apparently, due to internal squabbling between the designer and Konami, it was scrapped. And if you play Resident Evil 7, it took a lot of the ideas that they were working on and just put it out there. So the enemy basically took their best ideas and made it another Resident Evil. Oh, bummer. But I guess that might bode well for us that the property raised its head a little bit again a few years ago and it didn't have enough power to stand up and a movie like this ain't gonna help it's not gonna <laughs> tell a new generation's not gonna go boy i want more but it is telling when this movie came out is when silent hill had its last gasps on consoles were they to finally get that together and i think konami wants to respect this franchise they know this is a jewel in their crown they'd rather take their time between installments than rush out something that's going to be lackluster again so i think whenever the next silent hill game comes could we see another silent hill movie i i won't say i don't think it could happen i do say I could see a reboot where they actually go to Silent Hill 2, new characters, new story, same town, just like the games did. Yeah, there'll be no continuation of Alessa and Sharon or whatever she's calling herself this week. I mean, that is way dead. But yeah, could they go to a mysterious town called Silent Hill and have adventures in a TV series or a movie series? Absolutely. Everything old becomes new again. And it was a good game. So why not? There's something to go back to and enjoy. A new filmmaker could find it and revitalize it. But how vital is the second installment? Justin Stewart, how strongly don't you recommend Silent Hill Revelations 3D? 
Justin? <laughs> Obviously, it sounds like a train wreck from what we've been talking about. And it is. It's just, it's a mess that's hard to follow. It's hard to care about any of these characters. Some of the visuals are okay, but it's not nearly enough to keep me interested in this movie or the franchise. Last week, I had no expectations and was let down after the nice, strong start that movie had. This one starts on a sour note and never corrects. Its only redeeming quality is is that it was a good half hour shorter than the original. And it's a little more breezy than the first one. But this one hurts more than that first one. Because the first one had disappointment. This one just kind of felt like a gut punch that never stopped. So yeah, this this is a more strong red arrow for me. Stewart. Yeah, a lot got revealed here to a character with amnesia. If you didn't see the movie last week... If you did not know the original, they'll retell it to you badly. They'll rehash everything that was cool about Silent Hill on half the production budget, and it will be supremely unscary, unemotional, and unnecessary. The only thing that you haven't already experienced that is revealing here is you can watch a father give his teenage girl permission to elope with Jon Snow, which even then I think you can go to the internet and and read some fanfic for Game of Thrones and see done better than it's done here. My one compliment is that I do think that they kept the feel of gameplay, that there still is some puzzle solving that vaguely reminds you of why it was fun to play Silent Hill. And maybe, just maybe, this is better than Resident Evil 2, but it's horrible and a big fat red arrow. When the movie started, I'm like, wow, could this actually improve upon the last? No, it couldn't. The opening 3D shots and the fact that we were tightening up the cast a little bit really made me have hope. But by the time the private detective is approaching fake Michelle Williams for the second or third time and is like, I need to tell you, I've been hired to find you. And I have and I told them about you, but now I need to warn you about this. Like, what? This doesn't make any fucking sense. And it went downhill from there. Silent Hill, no. Downhill fast, yes. Red Arrow, not recommend. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a disappointment because, again, I found a way to recommend that last one. But it starts there. Like, if I thought the worst part of Silent Hill was that last 20-minute climax, like, that's the feeling I got from the first scenes. I could just tell. As soon as we saw the evil little girl on the merry-go-round, I'm like, oh, shit. (laughs) But I think we're done with horror video games for a while. It's past Halloween time. I guess it's only right that we should continue on to something cuter more charming a little more retro we're gonna wreck it oh yeah this is a movie i'm looking forward to revisiting it's something that i watched a lot when it first came out on home video because i had my daughter was of the age where this is one of her favorite movies so i'll be i'll be interested to see if i can get her to sit down and watch it with me again my assumption is it is toy story for people that played with pixels and not with action figures yes but let's not give it too much credit i mean i'm looking forward to revisiting it i've only seen it once but all i'll say is it ain't pixar it's disney right that is an important but subtle distinction i agree well we're covering wreck it ralph next week and then because it's coming out in theaters wreck it ralph ralph breaks the internet apparently i don't know what that means yeah we'll have to find out it's a long time coming for a sequel well he definitely knocks out creed because that movie also opens next week we're gonna have to delay that an extra week so that we get to wreck it ralph 2 first Yes, we've put our chips on the table. We think Wreck-It Ralph is going to wreck Creed when it comes to box office money, mainly because Creed is a emotional drama and Wreck-It Ralph brings in big families and probably for 3D tickets and IMAX screenings. But we have quite a bit else going on. Our M. Night Shyamalan series starts this Friday. So if you're not done with horror, you can join us to We See Dead People and We See Bad Movies. With the M. Night Shyamalan series, is The Sixth Sense going to be one of the bad movies? Probably not. It's got the best reputation of anything he's ever tainted with his touch. Yeah, it starts off well. I mean, we're acting as if everything M. Night has put out has been truly terrible, but uh, only about half of them are truly at wood level. It started out well. Everyone called him the new Spielberg, the new Orson Welles, the new Alfred Hitchcock. And then, yeah, uh, somewhere around, I would even argue, signs, but certainly the village, things go horribly, horribly wrong. But it'll be fun to revisit. I certainly love watching him box himself into twist endings and silly contrivances. So if you'd like to support our show and get 
an extraordinary number of bonus shows between the platinum shows and the silver shows that are all available right now and all the M night we're going to be doing starting this Friday. And we're not ending until we shatter glass next year because get it. I think that movie's going to suck too. <laughs> <laughs> it's got lofty goals pulling characters in from other movies that weren't originally connected, right? Yeah. I mean, that's really easy. That's, I mean, so many movies do that well, like justice league and, <laughs> But all the details are at nowplayingpodcast.com forward slash donate. And Justin Stewart, thank you for joining me. And until next week, game over. That was the end of Silent Hill. These were good people. Most of them. Some might say deserve it. Thank you for listening to this episode of Now Playing Podcast. We hope you've enjoyed the show. You're kind of funny. You're pretty fucked up, but I don't know. I, I think you're goofy fun inside. Goofy fun. That'd be nice for a change. Come back to NowPlayingPodcast.com each week for another new movie review podcast. You burned in the fire that you started and nothing can save you because you're already damned! Also at our site, you can find hundreds of other movie reviews, including Star Wars, A Nightmare on Elm Street, Independence Day, The Avengers Films, Back to the Future, Batman, Superman, The Fast and the Furious, and more. Another one will come. This is still a place of lost souls. Now Playing Podcast is a show without any sponsors or ads. We rely on support from listeners like you to keep Now Playing operating. There is nothing you can do to save him without damning yourself. I don't care. Just tell me what you know. You can donate to the show and, as our thank you, receive bonus podcasts. Over 150 bonus movie reviews are available to choose from on the Now Playing Podbean page, including Alien, Night of the Living Dead, Jurassic Park, Ghostbusters, Indiana Jones, Lord of the Rings, Psycho, Troll, and more. Why'd you cut off the cards? Look, Chris, that's not going to stop me from taking her there. Find a full list of available bonus shows at nowplayingpodcast.com forward slash donate. I'm not okay. I need your help. Please, please hurry. You can also join the Now Playing Patron campaign through our Podbean site. Patrons of $10 or more get a new exclusive movie review every month. Plus, even more perks, including one where you can pick a movie for our host to review. Find the details on our website. I'm trying to help you. Get back! Why? Because I didn't know who I was working for then, but I do now. If you want even more Now Playing reviews, place your order now for the first Now Playing book, Underrated Movies We Recommend. Get reviews of 125 films our hosts love. You can order the book by clicking the banner at the top of our homepage. And anyone's name not found written in the book of life, they will be thrown into the lake of fire. You can follow Now Playing on Facebook and Twitter, where we post announcements of new episodes and where the hosts post movie mini reviews. Links to our social media pages are available on our homepage. The Facebook, nothing like that? Fuck Facebook. Now Playing Podcast is produced by Arnie Carvalho. You created this nightmare. Everyone has a different nightmare in Silent Hill. I am there. Now Playing's video game retrospective series is edited by Arnie. You're in your own house. Now Playing credits read by Brock. Have you heard a single word I've said? Yeah. Have you heard a single word I've said? The opinions expressed on Now Playing are those of the individual hosts and may not reflect the opinion of Venganza Media Incorporated. You darkened the heart of an innocent. And now you cower in the face of a lesser's revenge. Venganza Media Incorporated is not affiliated with the motion pictures reviewed or otherwise referred to herein. All movie clips and music included in this podcast are the intellectual property of the respective copyright holders. They are included here for the purpose of review and no infringement is intended.
What's your definition of justice, huh? Many different forms of justice, Chris. So you've got man's, God's, and even the devil's. Certain forms you just can't control. So I want you to go home now to your nice warm bed and let me deal with this town and what has happened over the last 30 years. Okay? End of story. Now Playing Podcast is an exclusive trademark of Venganza Media Incorporated and may not be used without the expressed written permission of Venganza Media Incorporated. All rights reserved. You're under arrest. What? You have the right to remain silent. Why? Anything you say what the hell is against you in a court of law. Now Playing is a Venganza Media production, copyright 2018, and no part of this show may be reproduced, repurposed, or redistributed without the written permission of Venganza Media Incorporated. Now the dream of this life must end, and so too must the dreamers within it. For over 30 years, they've lied to their own souls. For 30 years, they've denied their own fate. But now is the end of days, and I am the Reaper. Deborah Kale Unger. Martin Donovan. And there's got to be a with. John Bean. Rada Mitchell. I'm thinking Malcolm McDowell. There has to be a with or an and. Or a paycheck. 